We're walking through the book of Nehemiah, and, and what we've said is it's never too late for a new beginning. I want you to look at your neighbor and say it's never too late for your new beginning. Never too late. God has something for you. All you've got to do is step in and do it. Receive it. Take it. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violence take it by force. There's some things you have to do to step into your new beginning at times. And whenever you attempt your new beginning or any work for God, opposition always comes. I'll just let you know that ahead of time. You're going to face opposition. There will be opposition from without and many times from within. And sometimes Satan uses those who are closest to us to, to discourage and mock us. Last week we saw that, that they, the people had a, a heart to pray, a mind to work, and they had an eye to watch. You've got to realize the enemy is real. And he's out to stop the work that God wants to do in your life. So, well, I never had any issues before I gave my life to God. Right, because you were on his team. You weren't the opposition back then, but you are now. And he's doing everything he can to, to destroy you, to try to get you from moving into your new beginning, into the destiny God has for you. So James tells us, draw near to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. So resist him, pray, work, watch, keep moving forward. Pray the details. Tell God what you need. Lay it out. And thank him for what he's already done. When you pray the details, it's a stress reliever. You're not carrying it any longer. You give it to God. And his peace, the peace of God that goes beyond understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the promise of the word of God. So don't let the confusion and taunting of the enemy deter you. Guard yourself, guard your home. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Say to yourself, I will rise up and build. I will start my new beginning. Come on. I will. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6, we pick up the story. At last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and they, that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. And that's what happens when the enemy begins to see you moving forward, moving into your new beginning. He gets furious because he knows you'll be an unstoppable force if you can get to where God has for you. So he resists you. He, he opposes you. They were furious, and, and notice verse 8, they all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. All those people were enemies of themselves, but they got together and decided, let's attack the people of God and throw them into confusion. So, well, how do I know if it's God or if it's the enemy? Well, the enemy always brings confusion. God's very clear. The enemy confuses. Some of you talk to people, you think this is the voice of God, but it's a little confusing. Confusion is from the enemy. And he's always trying to twist stuff and get you thinking all different kinds of ways. But notice what they did. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. We prayed and we guarded. Verse 10, then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired. There's so much rubble to be moved. We'll never be able to build the wall by ourselves. And meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. Verse 12, the Jews who lived near the enemy 
came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious. Somebody say, God is great and glorious. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. Aren't you glad you didn't have to do that in the DR, Bob? Come on. As the builders had a sword belted to their side and the trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. Battling and building always go hand in hand. You'll find yourself no matter where you're moving into what, whatever new beginning you have, you're going to battle while you're building. It's just part of the deal. And if you don't want to battle, I don't know what to tell you. Because this is a battle. But this is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. You got to fight with the weapons that aren't carnal. Verse 19, then I explained to the nobles and officials of all the people and all the people, the work is very spread out. We are widely separated from each other along the wall. So when you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it's sounding, and then our God will fight for us. We worked early and late from sunrise to sunset. And, half, and sometimes this is life. There's seasons of life where you've got to do everything you can as long as you can. Vacation will come at some point. Trumpet will sound. <laughs> That's going to be a great vacation, a forever vacation with pay. All expenses paid. Come on. Half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. They, that way, they and their servants could help with guard duty at night and work during the day. And during this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me, ever took off our clothes. Now, I'm, I'm just saying it, it had to be pretty stinky. That's, that's my thought. Um, I know when, when I used to go to the Dominican Republic and work in the construction team, I took one pair of clothes for construction, and I would set it up in the corner at night. <laughs> okay. We never took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. Now take a look at, at verse 10, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10. I want to just talk about some things. It says, then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired. There's so much rubble to be moved. We'll never be able to build the wall by ourselves. In verse 10, we find an internal foe. See, sometimes the enemy is an outside enemy, and sometimes it's an inside enemy. And here we have an internal foe, and of all people, it's Judah. And Judah's name meant praise. God always sent Judah ahead of the armies because that's how you fight your battles, with praise. And, and Judah were the ones who 
would praise the Lord ahead of the army coming up, and God would always fight the battle for them, throw their armies into confusion and, 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 and win. And here we find praise, Judah, has turned into grumbling and complaining and whining and doubt and despair. And that's a problem. When you lose your praise, that's a problem, child of God. I mean, being let down by, by those you love and trust can be the most crushing of blows. We expect opposition from the external foe, but we don't expect it from within. The psalmist David says in, in Psalm 55, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshipers. David's like, dude, if it was an enemy, I'd be okay with it. But it's, it's a friend. It's my close brother. It's the one who walked with me in the house of God and all of a sudden is fighting against me. So I can't, I can't take it. Paul the Apostle says in 2 Corinthians 4, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but we're not destroyed. I'm getting back up. You see, some, some of that persecution, that perplexing, that discouragement came from those closest to the Apostle Paul. And many times in his letters he wrote, he's forsaken me, they've left me, they, they did this. I got to tell you, as you move into your new beginning, there will be so much rubble you've got to move in order to move ahead. There's a lot of rubble. You've got to take care of the rubble. Look at your neighbor and say, take care of the rubble. Take care of the rubble. The foundation has to be cleared. It has to be clean in order for the wall to get, go up strong, stable, able. You got to clear out the rubble. You got to sweep the floor. Get rid of some stuff. There's some stuff standing in between you and that wall that God wants to build in your life. That new beginning you have. So clear the rubble. You know, it, it can get really tiring and frustrating but we can't lose our praise. Tell your neighbor, don't lose your praise. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. That David's talking to himself. Come on, soul. Bless the Lord. Come on, don't lose your praise. Bless the Lord. Let's, let's praise him from deep within. Clearing rubble isn't a spectacular job, but it's a necessary one. One of the things I did in, in our new kids' wing, clearing out the rubble. Everybody, everybody tearing stuff down, but you got to have somebody clearing it out. You got to get it to the dumpster somehow. You got to sweep the floor. You got to make room for what God has for you. Make room for what God has for you. Clear out the rubble. Before you can bear fruit outwardly, you've got to bear fruit inwardly. And you have to be pruned to bear more fruit. And ain't nobody like pruning. If you're a plant, you don't like pruning. I, I, I didn't grow up in a family that, that had plants in our house. We had plants outside. I got married to Christy. All of a sudden, we've got a forest inside. And I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. And one day I came home from work and she had her scissors out and she's cutting off all the branches and the leaves and stuff. I'm like, baby, what are you, whoa, whoa, you're killing it. She said, no, no, no. This stuff's got to go because it's sucking the life out of what the plant really needs to give. And I didn't understand it, but I watched those plants grow and thrive because of pruning. 
Now I get it now. I watch her in our backyard. She walks around. She starts throwing stuff off the plant. Picking. I'm like, that's a good flower. No, it's not. It's gone. <laughs> Done. It's sucking the life. Pruning. Wash your life with the water of the word. Let, let God clean out the rubble of your life. Let him clean out the rubble of, of your, your spirit. Don't let your strength give out. Don't grow weary in well-doing. In due season, you shall reap if you don't faint. Come on. Isaiah 40 says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. You can't get it. You don't understand it, but God's working. He's doing something supernatural in you. And you might as well just say, God, I don't care what you do in me. I trust you. And I give you myself. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow weary, go tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. They that wait on the Lord, those who hope in the Lord, those who trust in the Lord. There's several interpretations of that word. Trust, wait, hope. It's all intertwined. And that word wait simply means to, to be intertwined. You got to get close enough to be entangled with God. Those who wait on the Lord, those who are entangled with God, will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. The old song said, teach me, Lord, to wait. Teach me to wait. I don't want to miss this. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Amen. Ah, sometimes you got to sing. Someone has said there's three kinds of Christians. Number one, you got sparrows. They chirp a lot. And they flit around from here to there. Just, just realize that someone who talks to you about someone else will talk about you to someone else. Sparrows. Chirping a lot. The proverb says, even if you're a fool, if you shut your mouth, nobody will know it. Just saying. There's sparrows, and secondly, there's pigeons. They take off like they're really going somewhere. But they always circle around, end up making a huge mess. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be a sparrow or a pigeon. <laughs> and thirdly, not only are there sparrows and pigeons, there's eagles. Eagles, they soar on the updraft of the storm. When the winds blow in, the stormy winds blow in, the eagle spreads its wings. And he soars on the, on the winds of the spirit. As things begin to blow, it just lifts him. So be an eagle. Those who wait on the Lord, those who hope in the Lord, those who trust in the Lord, they will soar on wings like eagles. But verse 6 of Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6 tells us that they're halfway through building the wall. 
And then just three or four verses later, verse 10, they say, this is impossible. We'll, we'll, we'll never be able to finish. And I'll, ju I'll just remind you that any work for God, any new beginning, you will probably hit a wall. And maybe halfway to the finish line. You're going to come up against something. You're going to face something. It's like climbing a mountain. It gets steeper and steeper and rockier and rockier. And you wonder, are you going to make it to the, to the top? You start going slower and slower. Your breath gets heavier and heavier. And, and you wonder, because you, you, you stop and you look at your progress. Then you turn around and look at what you still got to accomplish. And you're thinking, can I, can I make it? Will we able to make it? And you start to think, maybe there's no way. Because the initial enthusiasm has worn off. And now it's just plain work. I, when, when we started this church, we had a, a church that helped us. They sent some people with us. And uh, I began to notice after the first two or three months most of these people went back to their church. They said to us, it's just too hard. We thought we were going to come and things were going to be easy. Any new beginning is hard. In fact, even halfway through, you're going to say, I don't know if we can make it. But God is always faithful, and if he's called you, he'll provide. And if you'll stay in there and keep working, You'll see results. Do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time, in due season, you will reap if you don't faint, if you don't give up. But it's at this point that the enemy launches an all-out war. You'll, you'll notice it here in verse 11. He launches an all-out all war. When praise turns to complaining, the enemy takes notice. Satan can't read your mind. You can only hear what you say and watch your attitude. And if he notices that praise has turned to complaining, praise has turned to whining, then he steps in and launches an all-out war. Think about that for a second. Because if you're continually praising God, even in the midst of the difficult times, you're throwing the enemy into confusion. Yeah, but it looks like they should be complaining and griping and, and getting all upset and frustrated. And they're not. So God must be working. Oh, God's working. He's always working. Come on. Don't lose your praise. Turn to your neighbor. Tell them, don't lose your praise. Do not. Do not lose your praise. Meanwhile, verse 11. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them, kill them, and end their work. And then verse 12, the Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So again, you've got the enemy from without and the enemy from within. Even their own friends, their companions began spreading alarmist reports, putting fear in the people. Satan only attacks where a work of God is happening. If God's doing a work in your life, expect an attack. I know you don't want to hear that. But the enemy is always using fear and force. But in the middle of that, don't lose your praise. Verse 12, it says, those who live near the enemy, those out of touch with God and his power were the ones who spread the bad news. Tried to strike fear in their hearts. Where are you living? Those who lived near the enemy started spreading a bad report. They were out of touch with God, out of touch with his power. And I'll just tell you, you'll notice some people, even in this church, who will spread bad reports. They'll start talking negative. And all of a sudden, you need to realize, oh, they're living near the enemy. 
Because when you're living near God, where are you living? Where are you living? Because if you're living near God, you've got praise in your spirit and you can. No one ever comes into your life and has a neutral effect on you. No one ever comes in this church and has a neutral effect on the atmosphere of this church. So the question is, what are you carrying? Because you have an effect on the spiritual temperature wherever you are. What are you carrying into your family? What are you carrying into this church? What are you carrying into your workplace? Because you, you're a thermostat. You set the temperature. I, I, I met some people this morning. They were like, I'm like, oh, oh, let's change the thermostat. Come on. Where are you living and what are you carrying? Nehemiah chapter 5, about this time, some of the men and their wives raised a cry of protest against their fellow Jews. They were saying, we have such large families. We need more food to survive. Others said, we have mortgaged our fields, vineyards, homes to get food during the famine. Others said, we have to borrow, we've had to borrow money in our field, on our fields and vineyards to pay our taxes. We belong to the same family as those who are wealthy and our children are just like theirs. Yet we must sell our children into slavery just to get enough money to live. We've already sold some of our daughters and we're helpless to do anything about it. For our fields and vineyards are already mortgaged to others. When I heard their complaints, I was very angry. After thinking it over, I spoke. Now, this is where some of us get in trouble. We don't think it over before we speak. After thinking it over, I spoke out against these nobles and officials. I told them, you're hurting your own relatives by charging interest when they borrow money. Then I called a public meeting to deal with the problem. At the meeting, I said to them, we're doing all we can to redeem our Jewish relatives who have had to sell themselves to pagan foreigners, but you're selling them back into slavery again. How often must we redeem them? And they had nothing to say in their defense. Then I pressed further. What you're doing is not right. Should you not walk in the fear of our God in order to avoid being mocked by enemy nations? I myself as well as my brothers and my workers have been lending the people money and grain, but now let us stop this business of charging interest. You must restore their fields, vineyards, olive groves, homes to them this very day and repay the interest you charged when you lent them money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. They replied, we will give back everything and demand nothing more from the people. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and made the nobles and the officials swear to do what they had promised. I shook out the folds of my robe and said, if you fail to keep your promise, may God shake you like this from your homes and from your property. The whole assembly responded, amen. And they praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. For the entire 12 years that I was governor of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of the reign of King Artaxerxes, neither I nor my officials drew on all our official food allowance. The former governors, in contrast, had laid heavy burdens on the people, demanding a daily ration of food and wine because 40 piece, besides 40 pieces of silver. Even their assistants took advantage of the people. But because I feared God, I did not act that way. But because I feared God... I did not act that way. I also devoted myself to working on the wall and refused to acquire any land. And I required all my servants to spend time working on the wall. I asked for nothing, even though I regularly fed 150 Jewish officials at my table. Besides all the visitors from other lands, the provisions I paid for each day included one ox, six choice sheep or goats, and a large number of poultry. And every 10 days, we needed a large supply of all kinds of wine. Yet I refused to claim the governor's food allowance because the people already carried a heavy burden. Remember, oh my God, all that I've done for these people and bless me for it. People complained. And I'll just tell you, the longer you're down in the trenches, the easier it is to mistake the edge of your rut for the horizon. You can't see things properly. You start to complain, and grumble, infighting, Chapter 5 finds Nehemiah with more problems, internal dissension, which is one of the most difficult problems to face. And it nearly wrecked the whole project. I mean, they're tired, they're grumpy, there's famine, there's heavy taxation, 
the rich oppressing the poor, even enslaving their children. I mean, imagine the misunderstanding, the trouble, the, the friction, the mistrust, the doubt, the suspicion they're dealing with. They've been so united in their purpose in the beginning, and now they're being divided. And I'll remind you one more time that that's still the enemy's number one tactic. Discourage, divide, and conquer. Discourage, send dissension, divide, and conquer. Get people bickering back and forth between each other, divide them, and then conquer them. It hasn't changed. It's still his number one tactic. And the previous leaders had cared only for themselves and unjustly mistreated the people. So Nehemiah just lived a life above reproach, lived a life above suspicion, above question. And he said, but because I feared God, I did not act that way. We need to live with the fear of God. Unless you and I can say on a regular basis, because I feared God, I'm not going to act that way, our testimony will be a failure. Because it's not all about what you say, it's how you live. I mean, who's going to draw the line for us? Who, who's going to say what you can do and what you can't do? And what you can say and what you can't say and where you can go and what, where you can't go. And, I mean, who, who's going to tell you all that? The word of God. It's, it's interesting that in, in the word of God, it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because the reality is every single one of us will stand before a living God. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But you will stand before him one day and give an account. Work out your salvation. It's a personal thing. I'm not the moral police here. Though some of you think I am. You need to go tell so-and-so to quit. Like, dude, seriously? I'm not their police. Holy Spirit is. And they need to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. I mean, we're supposed to avoid the very appearance of evil. I mean, if it even looks like it's evil, walk away. Avoid it. Get away. And sometimes the world places a higher standard on our Christianity than we do. They expect us to be different. And when we're not, it messes them up. I won't be a crowd pleaser. I've got to be a God pleaser. And Nehemiah said, because I feared God, I did not act that way. Psalm 24, verse 3, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, the one who has, has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Someone has said some people drink from the fountain of knowledge, others just rinse and spit. I'll say that one more time. Some drink from the fountain of knowledge. Others just rinse and spit. Don't be the one who just rinses and spits. Drink deeply from the fountain of the Lord. So you have something positive to say. So you'll have something inside of you. So you can set your thermostat in the right setting. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord adds length to life. But the years of the wicked are cut short. Proverbs 14, 26, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. For their children, it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. Proverbs 19, 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life, 
Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. Fear of the Lord's a big deal. You say, well, all this talk about the fear of the Lord, what about God's grace? Let's talk about grace for a minute. The Apostle Paul, writing about grace to his son Titus, he says, for the grace of God, somebody say grace. grace. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Just think, today, God has offered you salvation. You may be in this room today and you need salvation. Good news, it's offered to you. It's offered to all people. His grace has appeared and his grace teaches us, verse 12, it teaches us to say no. Just say no. Anybody old enough to remember that? Nancy Reagan? Just say no to drugs. But God's grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and the Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, who are eager to do what is good. The grace of God goes along with the fear of God. It teaches us. There's some things you can't do. There's some things you can't say. There's some places you can't go. Because you're different. You're waiting on Jesus Christ to appear again. And he's coming back in the twinkling of an eye. Mm. So Nehemiah said, but because I feared God, I did not act that way. I also devoted myself to working on the wall. So remember me with favor, O oh God, for all I've done for these people. Remember me with favor for all I've done for these people. You say, well, I thought you got saved by grace and not by works because you can't really work your way. There's a man died, went to heaven. St. Peter meets him at the pearly gates. He says, Here, here's how it works. You need 100 points to make it into heaven. You tell me all the good things you've done, and I give you a certain number of points for each item. Depending on how good it was, when you reach 100 points, you get in. Okay, the man says, I was married to the same woman for 50 years. I never cheated on her, not even in my heart. Wonderful, says St. Peter. That's worth two points. Two points, he said. Well, well, I attended church all my life and supported its ministry with my tithe and service. Terrific, says St. Peter. That's certainly worth a point. Only one point? Well, I started a soup kitchen in my city. I worked in a shelter for homeless veterans. Fantastic. That's good for two more points, he says. Two points? Exasperated, the man cries. At this rate, the only way I'll get into heaven is by the grace of God. Bingo, 100 points. Come on in. Not by works, by God's grace. But his grace teaches us how to live. So Nehemiah says, I, I, verse, chapter 5, verse 19, Remember me with favor, my God, for all I've done for these people. Because it's not by works, but your works will they'll provide a crown for you at the end. A crown that you'll go ahead and take off and lay at Jesus' feet because you're so grateful just to be in heaven. But here we have the fear of God and faithful obedience and living, and that brings about the favor of God. The fear of God plus faithful, obedient living equals the favor of God. So how do I get God's favor? You fear God, and you faithfully do what he asks you to do. And he brings about his favor. Psalm 37, 30 verse 7. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. When you hid your face, I was dismayed. See, when God favors you, it's so, it's so incredible. Psalm 84. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. In Psalm 90, verse 17, may the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. 
One day of God's favor is better than a thousand years of labor. One day. Better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. Never too late for a new beginning. Today you may need to accept this salvation that comes by the grace of God. And I'll give you an opportunity to do that in a moment. Some of you may need to come to a whole new level of the fear of the Lord and stop acting like that. And I'm not going to tell you how you're acting, but you know. Because I feared the Lord, I didn't act that way. There's some things in our life we need to put aside because we fear God. And we all need to keep our praise. Even when things look dismal, it looks like despair. Remember the old hee haw, gloom, despair, and agony on me? Yeah, when things start to look like that, I'm going to go ahead and praise Him. I'm going to praise Him anyway. I will bless the Lord at all times, His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fear. I will bless the Lord at all times. Hallelujah. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. (laughs) His mercy lasts forever. His mercy endures forever. His favor lasts for a lifetime. Would you stand with me? We're going to praise him today. Even in the tough times, even though it may look like we're not going to make it. This is how I fight my battles. Yay. My weapons are praise and thanksgiving. That's that's what that, that song says. My weapons are praise and thanksgiving. My weapons, my weapons are praise and thanksgiving. My weapons of warfare are praise and thanksgiving. As I praise God, as I worship him, as I thank him, something happens. Something supernatural happens. Something shifts. Something takes a whole shift when you begin to praise him, when you continue to praise in the midst of the the difficult circumstances.